So my topic this morning for everybody is talking about um, posterior decompression techniques and spine surgery. I'm going to jump off. Hold on. Um, I'm going to try and keep this focused just on um, you know the things we do to uh, the indications for posterior decompression surgery. Go over a little bit about the pathology. Talk about what it can and can't do, and some of the limitations based on anatomy, uh, and then we'll summarize uh, with questions and any any uh, comments the uh, the faculty or the the fellows may have or anybody else involved. So um, we'll get started here. So how many times have you heard or said it's just a laminectomy, right? So how hard can it be? It people say, well, this is an easy case, right? It's always an easy case. And then you're in there, and then three hours later, you know, it's a train wreck. It's a complete disaster. You're sweating and you don't, you know, um, we, I think we, I, I will honestly say that in my career of doing this for a while, um, sometimes I think the most vexing things that I do in the most complicated cases I try and take on involve in some way, shape or form, trying to unpinch a nerve that is pinched or create, com create space for nerves, which is what we're primarily doing here. So I, I just, I, I always caution that while it seems simple, it may not be easy. And so uh, this talk is a little bit about some of the techniques, some of the uh, pearls, some of the things we can think about before we get in the operating room. And then while we're in the operating room to keep what should be, I'm hopeful for everybody, a simple operation, uh, simple. So that's the goal. <clears throat> so what uh, when we do posterior spinal decompression surgery, approaching from the back of the spine and obviously we can come in and decompress things from the front of the spine as well i think that's a different talk but the primary goal of anything we do where we're going to be decompressing something in the back is it's going to be typically related to decompressing neurologic structures what what causes the compression in the first place well there's normal degenerative changes as we age spinal stenosis synovial cysts we deal with instability and deformity regularly in our spinal uh, practices spondylolisthesis, all of these that can cause neural compression. And so these pictures that we have on the slides here are just representative views, both the cartoon and then the MRI imaging showing compression of the neural elements from something going wrong in the spine. Uh, you can have acute structural changes. I consider fractures or trauma causing acute changes. Uh, typically those patients will have a normal spinal canal, no nerve compression, and then have something happen and then suddenly have compression, a disc herniation falls into the same category of uh, once upon a time there was no compression and now there is, but um, we have to address these things and make room for the nerves once they happen. And then there's the rarer things that cause nerve compression, uh, neoplastic uh, processes and spinal infections can also cause neurologic compression that requires us to consider decompressing the neural elements in some way, shape or form from a poster approach. And there's variable pathology within these categories. So disc herniations are not all the same. Um, <clears throat> it, I, I look at it as, you know, where is the disc herniation? What is its morphology? You know, when I didn't put in the the, the, the listing here, what, it's, what is it made of? I mean, is it primarily soft disc or is it calcified, which changes how you can approach it and access it and decompress it? Is it recurrent? Um, I think we will all agree that some of our hardest cases are decompressing a nerve when it's already been decompressed and now you don't have normal planes uh, and you've got to go back in and re-decompress a nerve. Spinal stenosis has different flavors, different uh, presenting different presenting issues that come up with it, uh, calcification of normal structures, the things that should be ligament are no longer ligament, they're calcified, which changed the decompression. Uh, deformity can accentuate uh, compression and also make it much more difficult to decompress the neural structures in a deformity situation. Uh, there's all types of changes within the facets. Uh, this, uh, uh, the MRI at the bottom shows a, a patient with a, a large synovial cyst that is not just off of the facet, but also in the midline. So things we have to think about as we plan our surgical approach, how to best address this. You have facet hypertrophy. You've got, you've got unique changes when you have somebody with a spondylolisthesis, the facet tropism and anatomy create the need to consider if we're going to approach posteriorly to decompress the neural elements. We have to take these things into consideration in our surgical planning. And then, you know, my favorite case always is uh, going back in to revise a laminotomy when I'm, there is a prior durotomy and you've got to get back around what could be 
at least exposed nerve roots or sometimes extruded nerve roots uh, in your planning for getting back in. So all of these things present, but they don't present in a uh, simple, straightforward way many times. And so your surgical pathologies, when you get into the operating room, kind of have to be thought about uh, as much as you would do a deformity surgery planning or a degenerative fusion planning, in my opinion, when you're going into the operating room, even for these quote unquote simple cases. Oops, let's go back. Surgical principles. So if we're going to go into the spine and decompress the neural elements, we're going to have to put some principles in place. There are variable techniques uh, for doing decompression. You have laminectomy, which is the removal of the entire back arch of the spine uh, to decompress neural elements. And that is required for certain anatomical areas. Typically, uh, removing the entire lamina in the cervical spine for decompressing the spinal cord is necessary, but it's not always necessary in the lumbar spine. So you have the, the same compressive pathologies in different anatomical areas, and you're going to have to give uh, different consideration for how you're going to decompress the nerves. Uh, a laminotomy uh, is a windowing of the back arch of the spine to make room for the nerves. If you're going to do that, you have to be able to do that strategically to achieve the surgical goal which is to make room for the neural elements you're trying to decompress. So it's a more limited removal of bone and soft tissue, uh, which has its own benefits in terms of preserving more normal structures, but it also has to achieve the goal of decompression. And then foraminotomies require, in many cases, a completely different approach, which I'll go over in terms of making room for the nerve uh, or neural structures uh, in a different area of the spine anatomically that requires a different approach and different considerations. Um, because there are differences in the anatomical areas we're trying to fix um, and, and decompress, we have limitations on these uh, uh, various surgical techniques. For example, in the cervical spine example that I give you where there is spinal cord compression, most of that compression is coming from the anterior structures. There is also a kyphotic deformity. So in the setting of, okay, I'm just going to go in and decompress the spinal cord, posteriorly remove the laminar structures to make room for the cord, there are issues with instability that will develop because of the decompression that we chose to use. So you have to consider these things uh, in that uh, situation. And the same patient with a straight spine and the lumbar spine may do very well with a posterior decompression procedure without developing post-surgical deformity and or further problems. So it's the same problem, it's just a different anatomical area. And then there are some problems in the spine that simply do better if we indirectly decompress them through anterior type uh, uh, operations or posterior type of operations where we're restoring disc space heights, restoring alignment, which then indirectly decompress the neural elements. I'm not going to talk about that. I think that's a different talk. But again, certain things when we, we just because we can decompress it in the back or think we can, that may not be the best thing for the patient. So uh, surgical uh, decompression techniques, uh, I'll go over first laminectomy. The cartoon on the right kind of demonstrates the technique. Uh, the structural back arch of the spine is essentially removed in the diagram in, in that fashion, or at least some type of that fashion. The goal is always to try and preserve greater than 50% of your posterior facets to maintain stability. Uh, when do we do laminectomies now? In the lumbar spine, we do them primarily for getting access to things that require extensive decompression. So really bad spinal stenosis, uh, higher level lumbar spinal stenosis up at the upper lumbar levels in the thoracic lumbar junction. When we need access for tumor excision, for infection, um, when you have a congenitally narrow spinal canal, I think that you're, you're almost always going to have to, to go midline because it's very difficult to get lateral and preserve the midline bony structures. When you have a congenital stenosis, uh, I think you run the risk of removing uh, too much of the uh, facet joints at that point to create instability. So laminectomy still plays a role uh, in the lumbar spine. It's probably playing less of a role in our practices as we go to primary decompression because we're trying to preserve more of the bony elements uh, to preserve uh, function and um, also provide muscular reattachment once we're done. So, uh, but this is the standard laminectomy technique in some way, shape or form. Uh, laminotomies uh, are kind of the, now for me at least, and I think for most of us, the workhorse of, of uh, surgical decompression. You use a unilateral or even bilateral approach for certain pathologies, but for the most of what we're doing for decompression now, disc herniations, synovial cysts, and most spinal stenosis conditions can be effectively taken care of through essentially a laminotomy, which as we can tell by the diagram, essentially the yellow and green cartoons show the, essentially a tube in place. 
You can use a tube. You can use variable diameter tubes to see the back of the spine. Again, you've got to get visualization of the posterior elements to be able to do the work. You got to know where you are, and we'll go over that a little bit with uh, radiographic checking in the operating room. But the, the ability to ch change your angle, to look in different angles, using the microscope especially, which has been enormously helpful for me in terms of doing a much better job, I think, decompressing the neural elements and knowing that I'm done and knowing that I'm also in the right spots. Um, but the, the, the technique lends itself to being able to do very thorough work through much more limited exposures uh, with uh, the same uh, net result effect of uh, achieving the neural decompression that you're trying to get. Positioning, I think, is uh, something you need to think about. I think every surgeon would have uh, his or her opinion on best way to position. Uh, the standard uh, Wilson frame on the left uh, shows the patient essentially with a slight flexion of the lumbar spine. We know we do not want to fuse a patient in this flex position, uh, but for decompression surgery, it actually opens up the inner laminar spaces uh, slightly, uh, so it makes it a little bit easier to uh, th theoretically get into the um, epidural space for decompression. Um, in the uh, standard hall frame where the patient is extended, where we're going to do the majority of our fusion surgeries, it does compress the posterior element, so the laminar, uh, inner laminar spaces are smaller, uh, but you can still do a very good decompression in that position. It's sometimes a little bit harder. Uh, you got to you know your anatomy, um, but uh, both uh, both positions can be utilized. But I think the standard technique is to use something like a Wilson frame to place the patient in a slightly flex position. I've been using the pro-axis table now and flexing it to achieve the same positioning, so I think it works pretty well. Um, uh, decompressing the abdomen, I think, is critical during procedure. You don't want anything compressing the abdominal structures. You want it to hang free. Uh, if you if you don't, and there is compression on the abdomen, you can get a lot of epidural back bleeding from intra-abdominal pressure that you're creating by just patient body weight. This is really important for obese patients. Uh, if you put an obese patient uh, with compression of their abdomen, trying to decompress them, it could turn into the longest case of your life. Uh, we used to talk about the fact that it's like operating in an inkwell. So you're basically trying to get this little incision to do this little operation, and you can't see anything because it's constantly bleeding. So uh, positioning of the patient, positioning of the abdomen, things you have to think about. You need to be in the room checking because the worst thing in the, you, you'll get into is you get in there, patient's been positioned, you didn't check the abdomen, and now you're wondering why you can't see anything in the operating room. Uh, light positions uh, are key. you got to be able to see what you're doing. I always wear a headlight when I'm, I'm doing these uh, surgeries. And then you want to make sure you check your microscope to make sure it's set up to optimize your visualization in the operating room. So before you start, Make sure the op the operative microscope, if that's what you're using, if you're using loops, it's less of an issue. You've got good lighting and hopefully good magnification. But if you're using the microscope, you need to make sure it's set up to, to meet your needs in the operating room. Uh, so now we're going to, we're in the operating room, we're doing our surgery, and we're going to do L45 to decompress it. How do you localize it? Um, the most disheartening thing you're ever going to do is you go in, you do your decompression, patient wakes up, their symptoms aren't any better, and you realize I was at the wrong level. Um, so I spend as much time as I need in the operating room to be absolutely certain I am at the right operative level. So for me, I put a, so, what, so I prep the patient, I get them all set up, I prep the patient, put a spinal needle in where I think I'm going to be. So you see that first x-ray down at the bottom of the floral shot showing the spinal needle. Um, I place the spinal needle at the close to the midline where the spinous processes are and then angle it away from the inner laminar space towards the facet to get my picture. Um, the reason I do it that way is because I have been in the operating room where the needle was placed in the inner laminar space all the way down to the disc. And so now you have a uh, durotomy before you start, so that's not a very fun way to go. We try to avoid those typically, so let's let's really try to avoid those as we think through our process. Um, I then get a second x-ray when I place my retractor, believe it or not, in these microsurgery approaches. And I know, I think guys that are using tubes will do a fair number of fluoroscopic shots to make sure their tube position and their dilators are in the right spot as well. So this is not something that's just I use a very narrow tailor for what would be considered a mini open. Um, it's about the same size as an incision on the skin as a, as a tube based surgery. Uh, but I make sure that the retractor is in the right spot. And then I will check repeatedly with fluoro 
in a patient with a scoliosis or a deformity, you want to be absolutely sure you're in the right spot. And sometimes it's really difficult in the patient with a degenerative scoliosis based on fluoroscopic angles and projection to know where you are. Uh, I didn't put a picture in here, but I will place a Woodson elevator uh, around the pedicle. I'll do a small laminotomy and then get uh, either a Woodson or a Penfield kind of at the pedicle level to make sure I'm at the right space. So again, do as many x-ray shots or as many fluoro shots as you need to make sure you're in the right spot. And then for multi-levels, then you can go from where you know to hopefully you've identified well enough so that you can do multiple levels through, through the same decompression, but you've got to identify where you are to confirm. So that the horse has been beaten dead, but that's how I do that. Uh, once I'm there, um, I've got to remove enough soft tissue to see the posterior bony elements. If I'm doing a single level to identify the correct inner laminar space to see uh, the junction of the lamina to the spinous process, the junction of the lamina to the facet, um, whether you do it open uh, with a cartoon on the left or with a tube, I think the principles remain the same. The goal is to see the bony structures, see the inner laminar space, know where you are, confirm the level, and then everything now becomes uh, controlling bleeding, making sure your visual quarter remains open so you can see, and that if you're using a retractor, make sure that it is stable in position so that you can maintain that visualization corridor uh, so that you can do the work without the, the retractor moving. And then you, know, you have a higher risk of neural injury. You have a higher risk of um, getting off track and losing your level. So you make sure all of the stuff is stable when you're working. So a uh, surgical technique for various principles for visualizing in the canal, we got to remove enough bone to see what we are doing. So certain pathologic conditions require more bony removal, large synovial cyst, or uh, in the case of a, a intradural or epidural tumor, you've got to sometimes remove, in the, the case of a tumor, sometimes you have to do a multi-level laminectomy to have access to make sure you can do your planned durotomy to get intradural, to make sure you can get above and below the pathology safely and see it. Uh, the same is true with extradural pathology. You need to make as, enough of a uh, window in the spinal canal to be able to see what you're doing. So sometimes laminotomies need to be converted to laminectomies. Depending on the pathology, sometimes you have to do that. The goal, however, is to preserve as much of the normal structure as possible. Uh, I would rather give up the midline structures than give up the facet. Uh, so uh, typically I'm going to medialize first, uh, remove more of the spinous process, more of the lamina, uh, to get access to what I'm doing and then go superior or inferior with my laminotomy uh, before um, so that I can get access above and below where I need to work, whether it's a disc herniation that's extruded and, and subligamentous inferior or superior to the disc space or a large synovial cyst that requires more extensive decompression to get there. Um, the same is true with revision where you have to get above and below an old laminotomy defect. You need to be able to see where you were. You need to get above and below where there was already surgery so that you can effectively get back into the spinal canal. How to do that? I, I will thank, if Dr. Eastlack's on right now, I will thank him uh, always for showing me this uh, Diamond Burr years ago. Um, it has revolutionized how I work in the operating room, both from a speed, but also from a safety standpoint, uh, because it cauterizes as it cuts um, and is uh, basically not sharp. So you can you can use it in, in a more confined space. I'm able to more effectively do my decompressions now with much less blood loss, much better visualization and much more rapidly, actually. Uh, we have varying sizes of these, so for multi-level, I'll go with a large one first, then go to the smaller one to get fine detailed uh, decompression. Um, uh, the problem with the, the uh, diamond burrs, it gets really hot, so if you're putting it up against the dura, it can make a nice round hole right in the dura, and that's very difficult to repair, so I do not recommend using this right up against the dura. You have to be thoughtful of that. Um, it does require more pressure on the tip of the burr when you're using it. You have to push it harder because it is essentially a grinding tool. It's not a cutting tool. And you also need really good suction during the operative intervention because literally it turns into a, um, a snowstorm, uh, you know, a smoke show in there because you can't see anything. So you need uh, your assistant uh, to be able to suction the smoke and the uh, bony fragments or you'll get lost uh, in there very quickly. So. Um, and unfortunately, the, the bone debris from this operation uh, can clog the suction pretty readily and you're spending a lot of time. So have multiple suction tips available because you, you think the burr is the most important thing in your operating room, but actually it's your suction, guys. Um, so that's the, that's the key. You got to be able to see what you're doing at all times. And so all these tools have to work together in a very, very small space.
Other types of burrs are available. The cutting burrs require less pressure, but they can also cut things that you don't want them to cut. You have different cutting tips. You have the 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 first burr on the left is a as an end cutting burr. Uh, most of us will use the neuro precision, which is the one uh, the third burr there, which is a, a side cutting burr. Um, they all have their roles and places in what we do. Sometimes really hard bone. It's really hard to get the diamond burr to work, so a cutting burr can be effective for getting through really hard bone initially, and then you can go to your diamond burr. So I have multiple burr tips. I use the burr a lot. Some people do not. Some people use osteotomes. Some people use almost all kerosene. Uh, I use a combination of the burrs and the kerosene punch uh, to uh, get the bony decompression that I need. Um, and um, then, then we're able to work into the uh, soft tissues of the epidural space, which would be the ligament and flavum, and then the epidural space itself around the dura. Um, so again, di different tools for different needs and different uh, um, uh, things that we're doing. I do a bony resection first. So my typical uh, modality for digging and compressing posteriorly, whether it's cervical spine, thoracic spine, lumbar spine, is I will remove the lamina and bony structures first i'll do my medial facetectomy i'll take my decompression inferiorly and i'll try and really see the ligament and flavum in its attachment points inferiorly and superiorly and then laterally if possible before i remove it i uh, leave the ligamentum uh, as a protective structure um, because i'll take that out last before i get in to do because again many times the the ligament and flavum is significantly hypertrophic and it is a part of the compressive pathology, especially in spinal stenosis, so it needs to be removed. It has to be removed most of the time when we're doing discectomies because you need it out of the way uh, to be able to see the neural elements and actually be able to find the disc and remove it. Um, so, um, so I do my bony work and then I will do a technique where I will split the ligament and flavum in the midline, pull it away, and then um, and then finish the ligament and flavum work so that I can uh, safely work in the epidural space. So this is my typical um, technique for doing decompression. So it's bone work first, ligament work second, and then I do the fine work around the dura and the epidural space uh, to finish uh, is how I do that. And you can do it different ways. Um, this is just my way of doing it uh, um, for the majority of my compressions, but stay consistent in how you approach it because I think it will help you to be more efficient and also more safe in the operating room with fewer complications. Um, Basically, we're going to take the where the ligament attaches is the green structure. So it's it's interesting. You got this ligamentous confluence to the joint capsule. Um, I, you put the CT scan up here. You can see the calcification within the ligamentum flavum causing the stenosis. So um, I don't always do CTs before I'm going to do a decompression. I probably should do more of them, especially in older patients. Uh, one of the hardest operations you're going to do is when you get in, you think you're going to be able to get the plane between the dura and the ligamentum flavum and there is no plane between the the, the ligamentum flavum and the dura because the dura is, or the ligamentum flavum is completely calcified and adherent and there you're the next layer after the bony structure is actually the dura and sometimes there's not even much dura left there depending on the facet hypertrophy you got to deal with so these are the pitfalls so but the 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 uh, idea of doing a pedicle to pedicle decompression uh, the green structures are basically where the ligamentum flame is going to attach, where the facet capsule is going to attach. And so this is the uh, areas for decompression of the nerves uh, for spinal stenosis um, typically. And I will go typically to the medial pedicle wall of the inferior vertebra to ensure lateral recess decompression of the traversing root. And I will also try to remove at least a small portion of the superior articular process of the inferior vertebra as it extends up into the neural foramen to ensure adequate lateral recess and neural foramen decompression from a midline approach. And then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, far lateral decompression in another slide, so I'll go over that too. Um, and again, when in doubt, make sure you're safe playing with your curette or your pen field before you stick your kerosene in, before you put your burn. You want to try as much as possible to use your safe tools, uh, which I consider to be the, I use the angle curette a lot. I will try and find my edges as I do my bony work. Uh, I will con continually repeat the feeling of my bony edges, my ligamentous edges to make sure I have good planes before I cut with my cutting tools, typically the kerosene. So um, again, decompression technique, um, creating a plane before you put your kerosene in is extremely helpful. Um, and so I do that routinely. Um, once we're in the epidural space, uh, in some cases, sometimes the um, 
now the, the now the, the 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 real decompression work has to occur, especially in the case of something that is uh, extra dural, like a synovial cyst or a disc herniation. This is a disc herniation intraoperative a picture. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see my um, uh, arrow. Dural dural edge is here. Uh, disc structures are here. Um, this is the inferior. Um, side um, so basically you can use the suction to retract the dura or most of the time i'll use a penfield for this is not a common technique for me to retract the dura with the suction i think you have a slight risk of getting a durotomy or injury to the nerve so i usually primarily use a penfield four uh, or what or a love retractor um, to get access to the dural edge which you can see really well so if you can visualize this and this is key you got to really try to make that um, you got to see the dural edge. You got to see the traversing nerve root. Sometimes with a very large disc herniation, uh, it becomes quite flattened. Uh, it's really difficult. So I use a, a dry cottonoid sometimes to push into the lateral recess epidural space when I'm doing disc herniations because sometimes that'll free up the dural edge without injuring it. You can see it more clearly in the microscope to retract it. Uh, you want to do that gently. Obviously, you don't want to spend a lot of time. And I, I spend a lot of time. I actually hold the nerve myself. Uh, I don't have my assistant do that. Uh, I feel like I have better control. And I also know when I need to relax. So if you're holding the neural elements to get a very large disc herniation out, or there's a bunch of fragments you're trying to retrieve, giving the nerve root a break every three to five minutes, just stop pulling, stop, just stop, you know, just let it fall back. Um, give you time to kind of reassess your anatomy a little bit. Um, I do that as well. And then the very the last thing I say in there is don't bite or pull if you can't see. So never put a Penfield 4 in there if you can't see where it's going. Never put a pituitary in there if you can't see what you're grabbing. Uh, uh, again, then this be, so meticulous hemostasis, uh, you got to control your bleeding, two point electric cautery, hemostatic agents, flowable hemostatic agents, all these things that we need to do to control bleeding in the epidural space become critical when we're decompressing uh, and removing disc or uh, synovial cysts where you have to uh, create a plane and get good uh, visualization because you need to be able to see what you're pulling on. And many times in synovial cysts, those are adherent to the dura. So you got to be very careful on how you tease those off. And I will often uh, leave a small remnant of synovial cyst capsule directly adherent to the dura. I'll decompress laterally, superiorly, and inferiorly, and I'll leave that medial cyst wall there. It's uh, probably not worth the effort of trying to peel it off when it's no longer compressive when you've completely decompressed it around it. And, and that's also a different, slightly different technique, but it's something that's germane to this. Um, far lateral decompressions require us to have a slightly different approach. So things that are intraforaminal or far lateral are going to uh, basically compress our dorsal root ganglion. They're going to compress our exiting nerve. Uh, they cannot be easily accessed from doing a epidural or intra, uh, you know, midline decompression. So we've got to typically come lateral to the facet joint. Uh, I will do essentially a different surgical incision. So I'll make my incision about three centimeters off the midline. Uh, I will sometimes split the muscle. Sometimes, depending on the pathology and the level, I will sometimes come midline from that incision, bring the, 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 the paraspinal muscle out lateral to the facet. Um, but uh, for lower lumbar levels, I'll do a paramedian splitting. Muscle splitting, I think it's uh, less traumatic to the muscle. You've got to see your facet joint. The anatomy that you have to see in the operating room, if you're going to do a far lateral decompression, is you've got to see essentially transverse process to transverse process. So I think the key visualization, if you're doing, for example, an L3-4 far lateral disc herniation, is you need to see the transverse process of L4. You need to see the facet joint at L3-4. You need to see the pars medially at L3-4. And ideally, you probably need to see the inferior edge of the uh, L3 transverse process, although it's less necessary. Um, the decompression is exactly as we're seeing in uh, the cartoon in B and C. You're going to essentially medialize. I basically will medialize the facet joint until I can visualize the transverse process attachment to the pedicle inferiorly. So that uh, using the diamond burr is really helpful for this because you can medialize without taking too much bone, too much facet. You got to find that pedicle. That is going to define your disc space of the level you want to work. You've got to medialize out usually to the pars and to articularis without removing too much. Your ligamentum flavum and intertransverse ligament attachment attach right here. I typically will separate that off of the top of the transverse process of the inferior transverse process. So in this case, if we're doing L3-4, it'll be L4. And then I'll remove it medially where I've done my medialization of the facet and the pars so that I can get access to the nerve root, which is underneath that structure. 
Um, when I first learned how to do these, I basically tried to take off the entire uh, intertransverse ligament. There are an absolute ton of attachments to the dorsal root ganglion and the soft tissues, and there's a ton of small bleeders in that area. Um, and so it becomes really traumatic to the dorsal root ganglion, which you're trying to avoid. So now what I do is I simply uh, detach the intertransverse ligament and the ligamentum flavum as it comes around with the facet capsule. Uh, and then I will lift it superiorly and then I will find my disc base and then I will find that the exiting nerve root under the microscope and I will try and lift that up with the uh, uh, love retractor uh, as best as I can. And then you, you basically have access to the disc space and you've got to then visualize just like you would the, the disc in the midline where you're coming from a midline approach. Here you're going to find the disc. You confirm it radiographically here. I'll put a pen field for elevator where I think the disc is. And then I will work from there. So you got to confirm where you are. You can get quite lost on a far lateral if you're not careful. Uh, you you could be um, you think way too lateral. You're not medial enough typically. Uh, and then you got to be absolutely certain that you're at your disc space. So this fluoroscopy becomes very helpful to make sure you are where you need to be for retractor positioning. And then at the disc space you want to work at. So that's the that's the far lateral approach for decompression. Um, when you're doing bilateral laminotomy through a unilateral approach, that's another technique. Uh, I think some of us are really good at that. I know some of my colleagues do this quite a bit. I do it less. I, I tend to go bilateral decompressions for bilateral decompression. I go bilaterally. But a unilateral decompression under the microscope uh, with a tube is a well-described technique, and, uh, and the cartoons uh, show that, and the, the CT scan post-op shows the significant decompression you could get. Uh, by, and you have to tilt your microscope, you have to tilt your tube, you have to be able to see across. Um, you're basically here, you're leaving the ligamentum flavum in place so you can do your bony work with the burr safely. Ligamentum flavum will typically come out last. Uh, it's sometimes really difficult to do the contralateral uh, lateral recess uh, if, if there's a significant amount of facet hypertrophy, but uh, the CT scan in this particular case shows excellent decompression. You're, oh, you are removing some of your spinous process um, to get there. So that's key, you gotta go medial to do this. But this is a great technique if you wanna preserve all of the bony attachment to the muscle on the opposite side, um, less destabilizing theoretically and less risk of removing too much of the contralateral um, uh, facet joint. So again, this is a technique for doing decompression posteriorly. Uh, cervical spine decompression, I'll touch on briefly here. Um, Typically for midline decompression of the spinal cord, you're going to be doing laminectomies. And I think typically for the majority of cases, um, and I think laminoplasty is a different talk uh, because there, there's definitely anatomic considerations for laminoplasty, but just for decompression, most of the decompression work we're gonna do in the back of the cervical spine will be related to specific disc herniation pathology, to specific foraminal stenosis pathology, where we don't wanna do an ACDF or an anterior approach. Uh, which I think are the, the workhorses of uh, cervical treatment for nerve uh, compression. We're usually coming in from the front where most of the pathology is. Uh, you really can't manipulate or move the spinal cord or retract it like you can in the lumbar spine, but you can retract the neural elements towards the midline to get better access for decompression. But for uh, some uh, intraforaminal pathologies, a posterior approach uh, can be utilized. And the keyhole foraminotomy, uh, as evidenced or shown in the cartoon uh, and uh, cartoons that are there, uh, basically show the technique of, of making sure you get superior. You're going to take a little bit of the inferior edge of your lamina, and then you're going to work laterally, uh, removing the medial facet. Uh, typically, like we do in the lumbar spine, it's the same principles. And then you're going to make sure that the exiting nerve root uh, is decompressed within the frame. And if you are skillful and you've got soft disc, you can actually take out intraframinal soft disc from this by lifting the nerve root up typically done with a Penfield 4 elevator. You've got to get good epidural bleeding control here. So flowable agents are helpful. You got to be able to see again, back to the rule. Don't ever try and pull something out unless you're seeing it and you need to be able to see the neural structures um, here as well. But the, the typical uh, posterior decompression in my practice now is primarily for cervical foraminal conditions where I don't want to go through. Or I think it's better than doing an anterior approach or a fusion or a disc replacement. Uh, but I think the lion's share of cases are now done from the front. So in summary, um, you got to understand your anatomy. Uh, you have various facet anatomy variations. You've got deformity. You've got instability. All of these things will change your intraoperative evaluation and technique theoretically when you're doing posterior decompression. 
Um, if you think you're going to have a lot of calcified ligament, a CT can be extremely helpful. I probably should do more of these. Uh, I think it would help me to plan better surgically. I think synovial cysts are difficult at times because of their adherence and their size, and they generally require a larger decompression than a disc herniation would for most cases because of their extensive attachments uh, to the, the dura uh, typically, and also sometimes where they uh, essentially go in the spine. And you also need to understand your disc herniation morphology and position. So if you're doing a disc herniation, understand if it goes inferiorly, you've got to take more of the superior lamina, the inferior inner lamina space to get access to it. You want to see more of the traversing nerve root because you're going to have to retract it more. So you have to kind of think about all these things as you're, you, before you even get in there, you're going to start thinking, what is my approach going to be? What's my window going to look like? How big does it need to be? And then you got to be real time saying, do I have to enlarge this to see better? Um, so it's because you need to get safe access and around things. Uh, make sure you're sure of your levels uh, with fluoroscopy. Do as many x-rays as you need to do. Uh, and again, in some difficult cases, I will actually, as I've done part of my decompression before I take my ligamentum, I will actually place a Woodson or a Penfield around the medial pedicle wall where I think I need to be just to confirm I'm at the right space. You got to remove enough bone to see, but you also know that you can't take too much of your facet or you're destabilized. And then the, the final cardinal rule is take your time, don't rush. Uh, these cases, while they theoretically are easy, sometimes are not. And the, the durotomy will definitely lengthen your day in the operating room. Uh, so try to avoid it if you can, uh, because I, I think it makes uh, the, the post-op care easier and your, your life easier uh, in that regard. So that's my talk. Thanks, Jamie. That was great. I have three questions for you. Okay. Number one, are you wild for mild? <laughs> number, number, number two, no, seriously, number two, um, do you think the juice is worth the squeeze with endoscopic procedures um, in the lumbar spine? And then number three is how do you approach the flat tire disc? Someone who's lost sort of that disc hydration, they're getting sort of redundancy of the disc annulus or bulging of the disc annulus when they stand. Um, and with that, are you ever looking at upright MRI scans? All right. Go okay. So, it. right. So, so am I wild for mild? The answer, the answer is no. So, so in the beginning of my talk, Don, I talk about, you know, can we, I think the first principle we have to do is pick our, our technique so that we're doing effective surgery, right? So getting enough decompression to achieve symptomatic relief of what we're going after. So for me, and, and every time I've looked at the mild, when it first came out years ago, I looked at it, I'm like, typically simply removing ligamentous tissue without doing adequate bony structural relief. Um, I just don't see we're going to get enough the decompression. Now, it may happen in some very unique cases, but for the majority of spinal stenosis cases that I see, even in the elderly patient, where you don't want to give them a general anesthesia, is that decompression going to be effective enough to get symptomatic relief? So the answer is no for that very reason. I don't think that in that technique, you're doing enough bony work to get access, to get the ligamentous structures out effectively enough to do uh, a lot of benefit for the patient, especially in the long term. It may give them temper if you can get a little bit of ligament flame out, which is typically what you can do. Um, again, there may be people who are technically so proficient at that that they do it well. But for in my hands, I, I think I would be doing my my patients a disservice and my my operations for doing standard laminotomies now through a small incision open take me, you know, assuming they're not complicated. And again, back to the planning, back to the localization, back to the execution of the plan. Uh, limited morbidity and very good results. So that's my comment on mild. Anybody else have any questions on it or comments? Uh, yeah, I mean, just to be to be fair to mild, um, the, the data is actually compelling relative to epidurals. So if you're sending patients, if they're if they're sort of uh, non-committal, not interested, or too sick to have surgery. Their data is compelling, at least I think, in comparison to epidurals to have some more lasting benefit. <laughs> but they they really haven't studied it against or head to head it uh, comparatively against decompression, as you said, Jamie. So yeah, uh, um, until they do that, uh, you know, I'm not sure there's valid enough justification to, to do that procedure over a decompression um, in uh, in most patients. 
Yeah, and I think it, they need to look at sort of like a volumetric decompression as well as post-operative imaging to really see the extent of the decompression. But yeah, I think there's a time and a place for it, Bob. I agree with that. Um, and I think there's some folks in our, our region or community that are pretty facile at doing those in sort of the higher risk patients. So yeah. All right, Jamie, yeah. next question. All right. So endoscopic, uh, I think the same principles apply. It, again, I, I think the tools for doing endoscopic surgery have dramatically improved. So in the right hands or the right surgeon using them, you know, I agree with Bob back to the data, you know, the mild, uh, I haven't looked at the mild data, but the endoscopic data, I think in some cases for some pathologies is pretty darn good. So, um, so I, I think there's probably in the right hands, there is a role for that surgery, um, that, that surgical technique for doing certain pathologies. I think for other pathologies, it's probably less effective. Uh, I think you do have the same issues that you have with mild, limited visibility sometimes based on your tools. Uh, so you have to pick your pathology correctly, um, but I think endoscopic, uh, especially as it's gotten, as it's developed and the tools have gotten better, uh, there's probably a role for that. So any other yeah, comments? Yeah, it's really bills? interesting because we've looked at it like in ESMIS a lot too. And I think the people that really put a lot of effort into it are, are real geniuses at doing those surgeries. I think one of the things is the, the cost barrier with the setup of getting yeah. all the equipment and machines whereas most every hospital or surgery center has microscopes for doing our standard opener tubular decompression. So right. that's one challenge. Yeah, I think and you said that is the juice worth the squeeze. So so it is, I think endoscopic procedures are going to be from a from a cost standpoint, Don, very much more expensive. Uh, if you can do a standard, you know, microlaminotomy, you know, mini incision with a regular microscope in an outpatient setting, patient goes home the same day, you know, and, you know, again, if you're going to compare then apples to apples and you've got a procedure that just requires your microscope and then standard tools versus an endoscope with the disposables and all the things that go with that, I don't know. I don't know where the cost effectiveness curve comes, but I think you're right. I think it's way more expensive theoretically for the I, setup. I, I, I just going to throw a little bit out there because I've, I've watched some really good talks and some of these experts at it. I, I think that can be true, but it's not always true. There's a difference between between some of these uniportal techniques with the high cost um, apparatus versus the biportal techniques with sort of standard arthroscopy uh, towers and equipment that, that are available. Um, so I think we have to be thoughtful about the cost analysis. Uh, if you, if, particularly in the setting where a lot of these are being done without anesthesia, uh, which is another cost driver. So. You know, if, if you can do these procedures without the instrumentation costs of the Joymax or Wolf systems that are a couple grand, I think, per case, or you have to amortize it over, you know, hundreds of cases, there's still an additive cost, and you can you can shrink the the cost of care that that comes from the operating room and the HR costs keep rising there, uh, and certainly if you take out the anesthesiologists if they don't need to be there. There's there's probably some avenues to make some some inroads on equivalency maybe in the cost maybe even better in the end for endoscopic. Uh, it's just uh, you know it's a tough learning curve. So I don't we're not going to get there quick. And there's yeah. no incentive right now in the marketplace for the surgeons in countries like ours in most settings to be doing this. I mean, look at our system. Who wants to spend two extra hours doing this and learning it? The system doesn't want to suspend the extra capital uh, versus Chol, where you know he can charge thirty grand for his endoscopic procedure, and so he's incentivized to do that over a standard procedure. So there's a cash sort of boutique business to be had right now, and there's perverse incentives on either side. So we don't really get to the answer to those questions, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree with you, Bob, completely. Hey, Blas, what was the third question again? All right. This one really points out how nuanced sometimes these decompression surgeries are. Say you get somebody that comes to your office, you're making a, sort of an operative decision based off from a supine MRI scan, oh. um, but they have sort of that disc that's starting to lose hydration and the annulus is bulging. And then you look on their x-rays and they have more disc collapse. And I guess what I'm getting at is what is your like real quick algorithm that you employ to determine if someone you should go for indirect decompression, 
Right. Or do you think it's, are you going to go in there? Because really kind of chewing away at like this sort of buckling disc annulus oftentimes doesn't really get the decompression, even if we hit it dorsally and take off yeah. the bone and such. Yeah, no, these are super hard cases. And I think Bob will agree. I'm sure Greg would agree. The, the, this is the difficult, this is the hardest thing I have to deal with. Where I have a lady right now, I'm going to do a decompression on uh, unilateral decompression has a very slight degenerative collapse asymmetrically on the side of symptoms, has the facet hypertrophy changes, but has that kind of generalized annular prolapse out into the foramen and in the lateral recess. And I think, I, I think, you know, I don't know the answer, Don. I, I think the, the, the simple answer is, gosh, it's just easier for me if I just do a fusion on this person, because then I know I'm going to get it because I'm going to lift them up and address the slight deformity. But she's, you know, you know, late 50s, early 60s, has unilateral radicular pain that exactly matches her symptoms that responded favorably temporarily to an injection. And, you know, if I can get her better by making room, doing a standard stenosis operation, you know, then then if I can do it, then she wins, right? Because she's not, she doesn't have a fuse segment. She's got some degenerative stuff above and below. These are these are tough cases. And I'll let, I'll throw that out to the other folks. So I, I think I have to talk, you have to talk to the patient a little bit about the risks, right? Yeah. Yeah, and I guess one other thing I wanted to tack onto that is, like, have you ever used the upright MRI scans? I think there's one in San Diego, and there's a couple up in L.A., um, and we were trying to get one at UCSD, but they're, the, the pictures are sometimes really quite useful because, like, it really changes the game when you load the spine. Mm. Yeah, so. Yeah, uh, I don't know. I don't have any, I don't have, I mean, that sounds fascinating. That it would change your surgical plan, and I would see why that is because you essentially that's a dynamic instability, right? You know, yeah, exactly. What I've what I've done more more often is what Jamie mentioned, not necessarily directed at the calcifications or the complexity of the decompression, but I'll get CT scans to to identify those vacuum changes in the facets or discs that are uh, proxies, I think, for for the dynamic nature. That's maybe not as evident on MR um, yeah. and X-ray. I, yep. Vacuum change in the disc does ch uh, theoretically change its your diagnosis a little bit too. I agree, Bob. Like I said, I probably should be doing more CTs just for bony anatomy, ligamentous anatomy. Um, had a really difficult case last week. Uh, surprise, the ligamentum flavum was not soft anymore. It was completely calcified and it essentially had, was protruding as a spike into the dural sac. I mean, that's what it was doing. The entire lot of recess was calcified. All the ligament was calcified. Yuck. Yeah. CT would have changed maybe a little bit because I still had to get it out of there. I mean, that's the reality for her. But still. I would have gone in knowing that was going to be my pain point rather than discovering it when I'm in there. I'm like, ah, oh, it's all calcified. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> yeah, it's so fun. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, the, the three-hour operation, that should have been a one-hour operation. And yeah. Yeah. And we've all been there, uh, still doing it, and I've been doing it for 20 years. So, yeah. So. Well, thanks, Jamie. Any yeah, else, welcome. guys, fellas? Yeah. Any other questions? Thanks, Jamie. Yeah, I have a question, Dr. Bruffy. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you confirm adequate decompression at the end? Like, is there a systematic way you're going about it, or is it more just looking at the pre op imaging and kind of knowing where your decompression needed to no. be? And no, Mike, that's a great question. Um, and so it's interesting, and I'm gonna I'll take you a little bit through some of the trajectory here. So when I do decompressions on a in a flex position, I probably am doing less bony work than potentially than I should be. Um, if you think about it for a patient with bad spinal stenosis, because and I, ideally what you want to do is decompress the neural elements in their worst position, which is extension. Um, so what I will typically do in my in my current when I'm to the confirmation of being done is bony work above, bony work below. So let's say I'm doing a unilateral laminotomy for a lateral recess and spinal stenosis at L4-5. You take enough of L4, you take enough of L5 superiorly so that the ligamentum flavum attachment has been identified under the microscope and removed. You've got to make sure that you, what I do is I will typically take my decompression laterally out to the level of the medial pedicle wall but trying to look down into the lateral recess so we don't over-resect the facet 
I think you have to see a little bit of that superior articular process as it extends up above and around the disc base that has to be removed. Uh, some people use the curette to break it up and then take it with a small kerosene. I take all the ligament and flavum out of the lateral recess if I can see it to remove it and then use the curette to make sure that's adequately decompressed out the foramen. I will then take when I'm done, I will take my Woodson elevator and I will make sure it passes out the exiting foramen and then around the medial pedicle wall to follow the traversing route out with no compression. So that's how I do it. So the Woodson becomes my final test. I also visualize to make sure that there is minimal to no indentation of the dura from any of the residual bony structures, particularly that superior edge of the inferior lamina. So, so if it's still, it looks like it's still compressing down on the on the dura, I will sometimes then just tuck a, a small cottonoid up underneath there and then remove just a little bit more, a couple millimeters of superior edge of the inferior lamina to make sure that I've got adequate lateral recess and central canal decompression uh, before I'm done. So there's some visual confirmation, but there's also tactile confirmation. And I'll let the other surgeons interject on that same thing. I lose you guys. Nope, I can hear you. <laughs> it got quiet, didn't it? Yeah, it did. You just dropped yeah, the yeah. mic, Jamie. That's what you I did. did. I guess that's how you do it. <laughs> yeah, no, that that was very helpful. Thank you. Good.